Hello everybody and welcome to Liège Baston Liège the 102nd edition of this race which started way back in 1892 and the word epic springs to mind when you look down on the Ardennes forest here this afternoon because yes it is cold it is very very cold the weather hovering at around about one degree Celsius well welcome to all you brave followers who've turned on in the United States eight o'clock in the morning New York time five o'clock in the morning California time and uh, we are looking to a dramatic race these are the former winners of Liège Baston Liège a defending champion Alejandro Valverde is back and is in the field Simon Gerens who won this race back in 2014 Dan Martin who won it in 2013 he's in the field as well Philippe Gilbert pulled out this week because of medical reasons by his team uh, BMC he in fact was born uh, almost right on the race route down towards the end of the very famous Cote de la Redoute these are the wins by nations over the last couple of years uh, 59 times Belgium has dominated this race uh, Italy 12 times Switzerland six times and looking a little bit further further back Ireland has won it on three occasions yes once with Dan Martin but twice with the great King Kelly they used to call him and that of course Sean Kelly formerly five time five years in a row the leader of the World Cycling Championships. As we look down here, it looks quite pretty down in Liège, but I can tell you this morning at the start line as the riders started in, this was around about 10 o'clock local time, it was very cold indeed. Matt Heyman there, just uh, going up, the man who won a surprising Paris-Roubaix just a little while back, riding, believe it or not, uh, his first ever participation here in liege on liege Quick glimpse there at uh, Gasparotto, who won the Amstel Gold Race. Looking down here at Tim Wellens, uh, retain that name. He could be a little bit good later on. And Tony Gallopan, the French rider on the Belgian team. And a man who uh, says he doesn't know how his legs are going to perform. Uh, Vicenzi Nibali, the Italian national champion. Jürgen Vandenbroek, uh, riding for Team Katusha. He may well be sacrificing his chances. Uh, but in fact, Dan Martin will be trying to get himself a second victory. He's got a very strong teammate up alongside him. That's Julien Alaphilippe, second last year to this man, Alaphilippe. Alejandro Valverde. Now Valverde has won this race uh, three times in the past and if he can win it a fourth time he will equal Marino Argentine but be one victory behind the great Eddie Merckx who won this event on five separate eight occasions. The riders pulled out at 10.15 this morning under at the time there a little bit of sunshine as they made their way across the great valley of the river Meuse. In the leading car there the uh, organizer of the Tour de France, Christian Prudhomme, uh, pulls in the yellow flag. At the back of the pack, you might just have noticed that was uh, Dan Martin riding rather a special little machine, the Emerald Panda. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But as soon as they got out of Liège in the fir first few minutes of the race, riders try to form that early morning breakaway. That's always very much the tactic when you come down here to Liège, Baston Liège, and it took a while for that breakaway, in fact, to form at the front. And Nicolas Edé of Cofidis was quite keen to insist when they got up to around about the 15th kilometer a breakaway of seven riders began to form they were chased a little bit later on by a, an eighth rider and that was uh, Vegard Langen from IM Cycling and he managed to make the junction and this leading group of eight riders eventually managed to prize a gap closing up on nine minutes and ten seconds but a little bit of news because of the very bad weather I mean it looks quite beautiful at this point of the race early on but the snowflakes started to come down and the race organizers decided to cut short the race a little bit instead of going straight into the Ardennes hills they decided to uh, shave off around about five kilometers shortening the race from 253 kilometers or 157 miles down to just 248 kilometers and there's the proof of the pudding just over on the left hand side you can see that little bit of snow and so that's why the riders decided the race organizers decided to cut short the uh, race by a few kilometers because of these adverse weather conditions so in that early part of the race uh, this leading group of eight they went through the first two climbs of the day uh, very happily at the front end of the main field they left the course at kilometre 45 and then went straight down the main road to go back onto the course at kilometre 75 as I say shaving off around about five kilometres but avoiding some very nasty weather conditions as they went over the top of the Côte de la Roche on out then it was Jeremy Roy who was the first place rider over the top there and at this point they got themselves up to a nine minute advantage but one once they started to turn into what I call the turning point of uh, Bastogne, uh, it was a, a, a way, in fact, that the race was starting to turn. Now, this, this is the race route then, so let's have a look. 
So heading suddenly, and, and it's that little piece there that the riders actually avoided uh, as they head into the province of Luxembourg as they go down to the turning point of Bastogne. But it's all really in this last 80 kilometres that uh, liege bastogne liege unfolds because there are eight climbs in the last 80 kilometres or 50 miles of racing. And this is the race profile. Those two little climbs in the beginning, sort of the North Derby, if you like, but it's all down towards the end. But look at that last little climb there, the Côte de la Nagnotte. And that is a very difficult climb. I went to have a look at it yesterday. It climbs up only 60 metres, or 600 metres, but it climbs up uh, very straight, and it's a cobble climb as well, and rather a rough surface. Getting himself uh, up towards the front in the break. This is uh, Paula Tiralongo, the rider for Astana. Interestingly enough, uh, Tinkoff and Astana have managed to place themselves uh, a rider into the leading breakaway. And you can see the weather conditions now are starting to change quite a fraction. We've got around about 100 kilometers still to go, but this is the most important part of the race now. As behind, the teams that are now thinking about winning this bike race, that they're starting to get themselves organized. We've seen Movistar come to the front. We've seen Etix Quickstar come to the front of the main field starting to slowly eat into the advantage of this eight-man leading group. I'll give you the names of the riders in the group. I just mentioned uh, Pavel Brut and Paolo Tiralongo. He's the Astana rider who just went back to the team car. In the breakaway group as well, then Nicola Ede. Thomas de Gent, a famous rider for long breakaways. He managed to get in there for Lotto as well as Cesar Benedetti of Bora Argon. Also a youngster, well a young professional, although he's 27 years of age, Vegard Langen from IAM Cycling. He's just over there on the far side. Alessandro De Marchi in there for Team BMC. Two-time stage winner of the Vuelta a España. And the uh, blue shorts there on the FDJ rider, Jeremy Roy. Now they built themselves that maximum advantage of nine minutes, as I said, at one stage, but it's now because of the pressure of Team Etix quick step at the front of the main field and now being helped admirably by Movistar, it's come down inside of the six minute margin. So what's on the horizon now for these riders is very much uh, the, the old war of attrition in the last two hours of racing here. We're looking at 100 kilometers to go. That will take around about two and a half hours of racing under these climatic conditions. You can see the main field over on the right hand side and there's confirmation immediately. Etix quick step at the front as well as the dark blue and uh, lime green jerseys of Team Movistar. Alejandro Valverde must be the absolute number one favorite but there's a lot of riders a little bit further back would like to dethrone him. Valverde has been very successful in liege baston liege over the years. He's won this event on three occasions, but maybe more importantly, he won it over a two-year span from 2006, a ten-year span from 2006 up to 2015, with a victory interspersed down there in the middle. He's also uh, won uh, the other day, he won the Flesh Wallon, and he's won that race now four times. So he's actually won uh, seven of the Ardennes Classics. Uh, only beaten by Eddie Merckx, who's won 10 of the Ardennes Classics, including five times liege baston liege As you can see, soggy and wet conditions starting to come down over this race. Well, I hope uh, plenty of you have uh, tuned in to join us here on uh, NBCSN's Live Extra, giving you full uh, uninterrupted coverage of this race, liege baston liege We get to see all of the action here, no ad breaks slipping in there at all, as we look right into the eyes and heart of the this is going to be a very difficult race. There is a change in the race route down towards the end, as I mentioned. We've, we've got 10 climbs. We've done two so far early on in the race. Uh, Côte de la Roche en Ardenne is under our belt. So is the Côte de Santa Roche. Next on the horizon, starting to loom up for these riders, is the first of a very difficult series of eight climbs in the last 50 miles of racing. Côte de One is the first one up, followed by Stavolo. And here again, there's a slight change in the race route. In the past, the, the race has very often gone over the big climb of the Côte de Stocker, a nasty steep climb, very narrow, only about three or four riders uh, wide, and with a dangerous little descent into Stavolo. And then they set themselves up for the Côte de Haute Levée. Well, that's been taken out this year. And the only reason it's been taken out is because of roadworks, and we are expecting it to be reintroduced into this race back next year. <laughs> Again, talking to so many people over the last 48 hours down here in Liège, it's been, what does the radar say? What's on the horizon? What's the weather going to be like? 
Well, historically here, down in the Ardennes, it can change in 10 to 15 minutes. And just sitting in the commentary position here uh, in the little suburb of Anse, just outside of Liège, we're about three miles from the centre of Liège. It's uh, actually rather dark in the sky. Well, out on the course, the sun has peeped through once again. So coming back to the climbs, uh, the next one, as I mentioned, is the Côte de One, followed by the Côte de haute levée and then the Col du Rosier, which is a very long climb at four and a half kilometers. And the big problem here is the fact that it's uh, very cold indeed. It's around about uh, one degree Celsius, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's the, it's the icy wind that's cutting into the riders. Most of them, you can see, are well wrapped up to the elements. A number of riders uh, claimed they were caught out by the changing climatic conditions in the race a week ago, not too far away from here, and that was the Ansel Gold Race, because the weather conditions changed halfway through the race again. Very glacial rain came in over the riders, and many of them were caught with not the right to clothing for the event. And on this occasion, I think everyone really has been talking about the weather conditions, so everybody theoretically should be well prepared. But some riders handle these nasty weather conditions uh, better than others. Some will have got up over the last couple of days thinking this is going to make it a tough race. I'm ready for this, I'll be prepared for this. And Alejandro Valverde certainly is one of those riders. In fact, it's his, mon his birthday on Monday turns at 36 years of age and he still has that youthful enthusiasm that he's had for many many years and he really is as you can see the team are solidly built around him his team uh, Movistar there in those dark blue and lime green jerseys are chasing the prey five and a half minutes is the gap up to these eight leaders got about 13 kilometers till the riders get to the Côte de One. It's the small chateau down towards the right hand side. Uh, a lot of battles taking place here in the heart of the Ardans and probably one of the most famous ones was the Battle of the Bulge which was uh, right in the heart of Bastogne in September 1944. A little early on, a number of people concerned about the race organization actually changing the race route out on the course. They uh, shaved off uh, only about five kilometers or so, but made the race a little bit easier. And people were concerned that it might advantage the breakaway, who had at that point around about a nine minute advantage over the peloton. But it seems that the peloton have got it pretty much under control. They've shaved it down to five and a half minutes inside 100 kilometers or 62 miles of racing left to go. And I think we're on course now for a pretty standard finish to Liège, Baston Liège. But it will be, I think, a little bit more dramatic. A lot of riders quite reticent about this change down towards the end. Uh, over the last few years, we've had that very nasty climb in the little Italian suburb of Liège, uh, of uh, Tilleur, the Côte de Saint-Nicolas, where in the past, if you've had the legs, you've been able to make that breakaway and get away clear towards the finishing line. But now with this little addition of the Côte de la Rue Nagneau, it really is a beastly little climb. And not only is it a cold climb, it goes, it goes straight up almost uh, in sight of the finishing line here in Liège. It's uh, quite, uh, quite a torture, really, that the race organization have uh, put in because you, you're coming up the original finishing straight that you've come over over the last number of years, then take a right-hand turn, and it goes straight up this horrible climb of Venenio. And the man who has the, the freshest legs there has got a very good chance of getting away with a solo victory because that climb summits are just two and a half kilometers to go to the finish early slopes of the Côte de One. There you go, 2.8 kilometers. That's uh, just around about 1.8 miles. The average gradient is not very much more than about 7.4%. It's a narrow road. You see the change in the road around here in the Ardennes. We've got these beautiful long wide valley roads and we turn off onto these slightly narrow roads and the road surface is also a little bit broken. You can see if you look down there, these are roads that are very much damaged by the, the winter climate. We're in the highest part of Belgium. In fact, in fact, a little earlier on, we went past almost the highest point in Belgium. And that, of course, it, it might not sound like very much, but when the, the nasty weather starts to come down, the highest point in Belgium is actually 680 meters above sea level. And it's a, a little place called the Barak Fritur, which means the chip shop. Strangely enough, I suppose that's quite iconic, really, when you think about uh, Belgium. 
in the fridge that they make here. Top of these climbs, there's uh, a 500 euro prize for each rider to go across. Uh, the top that's around about $600. Uh, so far, uh, Jeremy Watt went over the top of the first two climbs in first place. Uh, but there's no king of the mountains uh, competition, uh, so to speak, here in the Liege Baston Liege. It's just really a question of pride. Sitting on the back there, the BMC rider is uh, Alessandro De Marchi. He's also uh, one of the seasoned campaigners, 30 years of age. He's now, and you see many of these riders actually wearing uh, waterproof raincoats in the early part of the race. But as we get now down into the last two hours of racing, you start to see them uh, removing articles of clothing because because of the pressure of the racer, the inner core body temperature starts to pick up quite a bit. And that's uh, the time when you've got to make sure that you, you kind of control it by removing uh, excess articles of clothing. And without a serious chase going on behind, just take a quick gl glimpse at the clock there, because it's now all of a sudden from five and a half minutes, it's come down to four and a half minutes with 86 kilometers to go. Alejandro Valverde has uh, said that he, he really is not sure how the riders are going to respond to the Côte de San Nicolas and the addition of this final climb of the day. But I drove up it yesterday with the uh, photographer Graham Watson who wants to make a, uh, a very close point to, to, to reconnoiter. It's quite important really for the photographers. We very often think, forget about the photographers. There's uh, one just over to the right hand side there. They want to know whether they can get to certain points on the course and get themselves back into the race. And what Graham Watson wanted to know yesterday was uh, with this dramatic climb, beautiful climb to look at, and it's going to be fantastic on television, is could he be there to take photographs of the, the hopefully winning move on the slopes of that final climb of the day? And could he get himself to the finish line in, uh, in time to get a, a photograph of the winner? Well, he seems to think that he can because it's a very straight climb, straight out of the town of Oz and then a rapid descent back to catch on to the old original race route and then the standard finish that we've had since 1992 here uh, in the small town of Oz. But if the, if the weather stays clear around Oz it should be some dramatic images and hopefully uh, some riders have got a little bit of extra energy left to make that final aggressive move but it is a very bumpy section of cobblestones it's not like the cobblestones of Paris Roubaix but they are not smooth and even as we see some acrobatics at the back here from Alessandro De Marchi De Marchi been a professional since uh, 2010 while well, we go back to the main field uh, this is the Côte d'Or you can see how now all of a sudden the main field is starting to stretch out but never far from the front is uh, Team Movistar. The, these guys, I think every one of the riders on Team Movistar will have one thing in their mind this morning and that is we've got a chance of uh, allowing Alejandro Valverde to write his name into the history books. He's won uh, Liège, Baston Liège three times and the other day he uh, notched up a fourth victory in the Flèche Wallon and talking to uh, a lot of people he is looking extremely fit and prepared and that's him um, just there you might have just noticed he had a slightly different colored helmet on a little bit of blue in his helmet he's actually got himself ready for an assault on the Giro d'Italia he looks really fit at the moment and he's never really if you stand next to Alejandro Valverde he's, he's not really a very big guy but at the moment he's looking a lot leaner and meaner than he normally does that was uh, Perik Kemener there from uh, the new direct energy squad. Oh, a little incident there from one of the Cannondale riders to stop quickly at the side of the road. You see the, when you look at the riders breathing, it gives you that, it just reminds you how cold it is out on the car. <laughs> I, I can't remember actually having uh, seen a bike race where you can see the rider's breath coming out uh, and uh, turning to a real, almost a fog coming out of the rider. So uh, they're 12 kilometers, and that uh, 12 kilometers is an indication to the next uh, feeding point, and that is when the riders go through the town of uh, Stavelot. Uh, 12 kilometers, 
that's about seven miles and that's uh, two climbs to go for them before they get to the feeding station at Stavelot, uh, the Côte d'Oin, which is there where we are at the moment, and the Côte de la Haute Levée. That's nice to see, they've even uh, adjusted the graphic as well uh, over on the right hand side to 248 kilometers. It was 253 kilometers uh, riders who were supposed to cover and because of those weather conditions and the slight change in the race route it's down to 248 which is about 154 miles. And that's a pretty impressive average speed as well, they're just a shade inside of 40 kilometers an hour, 25 miles an hour, bearing in mind these guys have been through wind, rain, snow and hail to this point of the race so it certainly this is the part of the race though when it starts to get hard these roads are very difficult roads in the Ardennes and although yes anytime you go uphill it's difficult and hard but these roads you throw in a little bit the rough surface and you can see it's not a smooth tarred surface here it's tarp but with a lot of gravelly bits in it which makes it uh, much more difficult you, you it reduces the rolling go uh, it increases the rolling resistance that the riders have to come up against to keep themselves going forward in a situation like this De Marchi, uh, seems to be struggling a fraction to sit on the back of this group and uh, all of the time you can see the job that's being done by the main field because all of a sudden again another 30 seconds has been shaved away there's not much respite in the past it's been a very complicated and nervous part of the course here because there you can see the summit as they go over the top just have a quick look there to see who was first over the top it looked as if it was yes it was uh, Paolo Tiralongo as uh, the first rider to go over the top there for Astana followed by uh, Thomas de Gent but it was a much more nervous section of the race here uh, previously because you had uh, within a period of about 10 to 12 kilometers you had the Côte de Rouen, the Côte de Stocker which is a very famous climb where there is a monument to Eddie Merckx at the top of that climb and then over to the Côte de Haute Levée so talking to one or two of the riders yesterday they felt that this might be a slightly more relaxed portion of the course to uh, the way it's unfolded uh, previously at the back there uh, 83 and 84 83 Steve Cummings has had a pretty good uh, week of uh, racing here in the Ardennes and his teammates uh, think that he may well have a little bit of something uh, under his sleeve when it comes to the final part of the race so although uh, Daniel Tecklheimer not the Eritrean and believe it or not there are two Eritreans in uh, Liège Baston Liège uh, this week interesting to note that the race and, and the sport how it's become so much more international uh, Yes, over the years that the race has been uh, dominated in participation by uh, the French with 38 riders on the start line this morning. But I went through the start list uh, quite carefully this morning. 11 riders in this race from the United States on various teams, which just goes to show the strength and depth of uh, American cycling at the moment. 11 Americans, 8 Australians, uh, 5 uh, British riders, 3 Canadians, 3 South Africans. It really has become a very much an international sport. In the past, you'd only really be talking about the French, the Belgians and the Italians. But that is certainly very much now on the change. There's the main field now. They're coming up to uh, the summit of the Côte d'Or 1. Uh, just over uh, 100 metres or so to the top. 4 minutes and 12 seconds. Alejandro Valverde, well, he's looking for a birthday present as well today because uh, he turns 36 years of age on Monday. And I suppose if you're a bit of a statistician, you probably realise that if he was to win Liège Baston Liège today, he would win it twice in uh, a calendar year because, in fact, he was uh, just 35 years of age and uh, one day when he won it last time. Right, over the top of the climb. And now, uh, this is over the top of the Côte de Wain they've got a, a slightly different descent to, to uh, previous occasions as well because we're not heading up towards the, the climb of uh, Stocker so we'll drop straight down into the town of one across one and after three or four kilometers across the beautiful cobbled uh, town square of Stavelo which I only just discovered yesterday uh, up until 1795 uh, Stavelo was the principality of Stavelo dating back to the Roman Empire times and it's a beautiful abbey right in the very heart which dates back to uh, 650 AD none of that history at all of any concern to the riders from Team Movistar they've got one job in hand and 
One guy who's actually been riding pretty well for Movistar over the, the last uh, couple of races is a rider who actually turned professional for uh, uh, the French team for a couple of years, uh, A.G. Tuara, Carlos Betancourt, but he just had a hard time settling in with the French mentality. I think the Colombian rider, who is a, an incredible climber, finished fourth overall in liege Bastogne liege in 2013, so he's obviously the kind of rider who can get himself when he's in good form, he can get himself through these kind of races, but he is one of those uh, magical Colombian climbers, and he's going to be a very serious ally, I feel, down towards the end for Alejandro Valverde. Rory Sutherland, as well, is the Australian rider for Team Movistar. He's got a job to do. He won't be waving the flag for Australia this afternoon. His job will be to look after Valverde. one kilometers to go 50 miles this race by the way has got uh, a French nickname it's known as La Doyenne or the old one because it started way back in 1892 where uh, this is the 102nd edition of Liège Bastogne Liège and it's one of those great monuments to the sport where it's, it's a special kind of race and I think it's a very pretty race when you come down here to the Ardennes as we look again at riders starting to whenever they go to the top of these climbs they'll look to see if they've got any team helpers around and instead of having to drop back to the team car if they've got a team helper alongside they'll get the jersey off quickly as you just spotted that rider from uh, Cannondale there get the jersey off and throw it to the team car at the side of the road all of this helps to save a little bit of energy yeah, this is Alejandro Valverde as you can see he's uh, getting himself uh, lightened down he knows now that the race is about to get itself underway now problem at the back quick glimpse there and that in fact uh, was uh, Pavel Brut who was in the leading group Brut, very good individual time trialist I've seen him win a stage in the uh, Lankawi many many years ago when he was riding for the very early Tinkoff squad uh, that was a uh, stage nine back in 2007 he's been a professional since 2001 and certainly not the place that you want to have a mechanical incident he had a the problem with being in a breakaway like this and having a mechanical incident is you don't have that long convoy of cars behind you that you can use to try and get yourself back into contact but that group was riding at a steady pace we've seen an average of 38 39 kilometers now so with a little bit of luck he should quickly manage to reintegrate reintegrate the leading group of seven Again, I like uh, many other people have been keeping a very close eye on the, the radar uh, the weather radar over the last uh, couple of hours and they, they are saying that the, the worst part of the weather should come over the top of this race uh, in between uh, three and five o'clock well you couldn't have picked a worse time really for the bad weather to come down because it's uh, the, the critical part of the race there's the summit there as we go over the top of the climb just uh, peeping around there again and the rider who managed to get through there in uh, first place I thought it was the red jersey of uh, Thomas de Kent, but it wasn't. It's the, uh, it was Thomas de Kent, in fact. The main field, well, they've spread out, so they're leaving everything up. They know that the leader of Movistar is Alejandro Valverde. They know that he's the man who's won this race before. He's won it three times previously. And looking at the, the oh, little problem at the back here. This is the narrow, this is the, this is very, uh, typical of haute -Levay and uh, it's, uh, any rider who's ridden in this part of it always knows that uh, haute -Levay, they've got this strange little cement uh, divider right up the middle of the road, obviously for safety and security reasons, but uh, if you're not paying attention at the front end of the main field, uh, you uh, can find that it's just a little bit dangerous, especially if you're, you're looking the wrong way. Tête de la course then, back to the head of the race, 73 kilometres to go and the spots appearing uh, on the camera lens and if you look through there it looks to me as if we're starting to head uh, back into the snow just a fraction it's quite amazing to think that when you see these riders are starting to breathe you can uh, see the you can see their breath forming uh, right let's come up there that's Maxime Bouet Singoué, the French rider on Team Etix Quick Step. There's a lot of work that these riders have to do. One rider they um, must think about as well. I think we talked a lot about Dan Martin. We talked a lot about uh, Alaphilippe, but uh, one of the riders on their squad who's uh, 
and the national uh, champion or uh, national road racing champion of the Czech Republic is Peter Vakoc and he is riding extremely well he put in a sterling performance uh, about two weeks ago to win the Brabantse Pile or the Flesh Brabazon race which is braced uh, just around the uh, area of Brussels he's also had three wins so far this year so he's in good form but that uh, is the man they hope can uh, break the bad luck of France number 12 there a la Philippe you know the French have not won this race for 36 years and of course uh, the last man to win it for France uh, 36 years ago in conditions probably a little bit worse than this in fact uh, were of course the great Frenchman Bernard Hinault. he won that race by nine and a half minutes and as I said a little bit earlier on there were only 21 riders on the finishing line I put my hand up as well to say that I was not one of those on the finishing line I, my claim to fame is I rode Liège Bastogne and I took the car back towards the finish line. It was a horrendous, a dantesque day uh, in the saddle. And Bernardino, uh, in fact, it was so cold that when he got to the finish line, Bernardino had frostbite in two of his fingers and it took a number of months to recover from that, even though he did have a massive big pair of gloves on. He was a tough character and still to this day remains a tough character. Now look at these weather conditions are changing as we look at this race here. Everybody extremely wrapped up and what's making it worse, it is just hovering at that one degree Celsius, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, I know uh, the clothes have improved over the years, but uh, it doesn't matter what sort of clothes you've got. These are horrible elements to be racing in, but this is one of the monuments of the sport. This is one of the big events, one of the big five one-day cycling events uh, in cycling. Uh, you have Milan San Remo to start it off, uh, the Tour of Flanders, followed uh, by Paris-Roubaix, then Liège, Bastogne, Liège. And this is one of the monuments, and then it capped all off towards the end of the year with a uh, beautiful race in uh, Italy, the Giro di Lombardia. Well, you can just you can see the concentration of the on the faces of these riders from Movistar. They know they've just job done, get it done. 71 kilometres. They're looking down and uh, figuring out how much further they have to get themselves uh, down towards the finishing line. How much work they need to do. Valverde. He has said Valverde that he's uh, more concerned about the snow and the bad weather rather than the addition of the new climb. So that goes to say that that's a man in fine form. Uh, But it is a question of really looking after yourself. It's extreme. It's, it's more important today to look after yourself than it would be in a, in a normal Liège Bastogne. Liège. This, this up and down all the time. Uh, these na nasty little roads. If the weather condition is good, even then, because of the stress of the race, you forget to eat properly. But it's more important, more critical on a day like this. And these these images really are quite impressive. It's just hovering, that, that temperature is just hovering between just between uh, around about uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 37 degrees Fahrenheit and it, a little bit of snow, a little bit of icy rain coming in and it goes and wets you right the way through to the bone. Well here's uh, the left hand turn. And this is, uh, if, you, if you've ever come up this part of the road, if you go straight on and that is the way that takes you down into uh, Francorchamps. They're now turning left off the main road and as they move away from that road they start to line themselves up now for the Col du Rosier my goodness me I think that was Matty Heyman it was either Matt Heyman or it was uh, Ned Kelly I wasn't sure the way he was wrapped up there as you could see these guys are seriously wrapped up to protect themselves against these weather conditions it's going to be a dramatic honestly I'm looking down at the finishing line here and I can tell you it's perfectly dry there is not a cloud in the sky at the finishing line and that could be We're just listening to the uh, race radio uh, telling the team managers to be very very careful to watch out as they go through as they start to go through the the feeding zone they don't want any cars any motorbikes uh, anywhere near the peloton as they start to go through the feeding zone and that is to look after the safety and what has been a very very tragic year for professional cycling uh, they have had some nasty nasty accidents uh, two riders uh, in race conditions uh, losing their lives uh, 
Dan uh, Maringer having a, a heart attack or being taken away from the race uh, and uh, passing away from a uh, heart problem uh, back in uh, March and of course in the Game Wevel game uh, race Antoine uh, de Moitié uh, crashing in Game Wevel game and passing away as well so health and safety for the riders has become an extremely important topic now that I have to say I don't think I've ever seen before quite artistic of our cameraman on the bike fourth monument of the season and of course it's the oldest one used to be part of what they called the uh, the Ardenza week of racing and there was a special prize for the riders who finished uh, best in the, the Amstel Gold Race of Flesh Wallon and at Liège Bastion. This is the feeding station and all those riders who were getting rid of all of their coats a little bit earlier on will probably be at the side of the road asking for an extra coat. 68 six kilometers to go and it's back up to four and a half minutes just wondering about those riders uh, in that breakaway all seasoned uh, campaigners riders have got to many numbers of professional years under their belts and riders who will know that on a day like this if things go wrong the breakaway could create one of the big big surprises in a cycling monument as is Liège Baston Liège and there was a have to say a bit of a surprise a couple of weeks ago when we were commentating on uh, Paris-Roubaix there's not very men would have picked the name of uh, Matty Hamer to win uh, Paris-Roubaix although if you were to poll the main field there would not be very many people in the main field who would be disappointed by the victory of Matty Hamer what a phenomenal performance by the guy who is known in the sport of Mr. Never Give Up and he never gave up, he went through some hard times in that Paris-Roubaix and he got dropped on certain sections of cobblestones, fought his way back in, went on the attack even when he was going into the velodrome he thought with uh, Tom Bonin, well not too bad here mate I could get myself second place but then again the race all regrouped and he went on to uh, get himself the victory beating some very very fast men and of course I have seen him here and uh, he will be wondering what is he doing uh, after such a long uh, professional career Matty Heyman who turned professional uh, back in 2000 will be saying to himself why did I come here today uh, another rider uh, has uh, abandoned at the side of the road there one of the riders from uh, Lotto this is in the a number of riders I think will have pulled out that feeding station there just came in at the right time I think for a number of riders uh, to pull out this now is going to come down to the part of survival of the fittest these are images that we will remember when Bernard Hino uh, won uh, his uh, Liège Bass on Liège in 1980 there was not the amount of television coverage that there is today technical as aspects of the, the covering of professional cycling back in 1980 certainly was not what it is today today we are following the last uh, three to three and a half hours of an epic bicycle race here through the Ardennes and there are still six climbs to go on the day and back at the Movistar riders uh, Valverde keeping close up towards the front there he is sitting about fourth fifth position got Betancourt alongside him, Emmanuel Erviti, Ruben Fernandez, Jon Izaguirre who's riding extremely well, Danny Moreno is along him, alongside with him and Giovanni Visconti and they're all coming onto form at the right time. Uh, Visconti himself getting a very nice little win uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the Classica Primavera as we get a chance here to look at, at the beauty of the region too. Just as uh, we look down there uh, that's the small town of Rui or Stumont and that's where we just saw it's amazing to think that about four kilometers away from where these riders are going through uh, blistering snow but the clouds are clear Rory Sutherland in second place now this is the next uh, this is the right hand turn here the Tête de la Course 65 kilometers to go and uh, we're now uh, lining up to uh, they've gone through uh, Stumont and this is a four and a half kilometers and this is the Col de Rosier most of the other uh, climbs on the day are Côtes 
uh, which is a shorter form of call. Uh, but these uh, two climbs are back to back here, the Rosier and the Makisam. They're four and a half kilometers and two and a half kilometers in length. And you can just see that. Rory Sutherland up into second position. Quiet, yeah, but I think he's very happy to have moved across to Movistar. He enjoys the mentality, um, Rory Sutherland, uh, of this Spanish squad and, and realizes it's uh, in a race like this, it's very much all for one man. But he's a man who, in the past, has come up with the goods, uh, Alejandro Valverde. Talking about the, the Ardennes Classics, the race we call the Ardennes Classics, and that. I'm not really sure whether or not I would pull in the Amstel Gold Race as a as a classic. It's a, it's a newer event on the calendar. It's only been around since the 1960s. Uh, well, Eddie Merckx has won 10 of the Ardennes Classics. Uh, five times liege Baston liege three times the Flèche Wallonne, and three times the Amstel Gold Race. Alejandro Valverde has won uh, this race three times and the Flèche Wallonne three times, and uh, that makes a total of seven Ardennes Classics. If he was to win today, he would go ahead of Moreno Argentina and only be second behind the great Eddie Merckx. The Stanley Cup playoffs. So, 52 kilometers to go. And now uh, we've uh, got to line up for the next uh, the next long climb before we start to, to get into what, what I think really is the most important strategic part of this race, uh, the last uh, 36 kilometers. Uh, Lining up on the horizon for the riders will be this next climb, the Col de Macisel, which is a very tough, nasty little climb, around about uh, two and a half kilometers long. And then we uh, head down towards the Côte de la Redoute. In fact, the Macisel was a climb that was introduced into this race in uh, 2015, uh, as they tried to uh, put in a few uh, longer climbs. This is Thomas Vogler. Looking further down the road there, uh, he's trying to ride himself across it. It's always a difficult call to make as a professional bike rider. When the breakaway has been established, it, it's, it's often very easy to make that initial move, to, to jump away from the main field, but then to actually consolidate and actually get down towards the finish. There, by the way, is the thermal bath of Spa. Now, uh, when we talked a little earlier about this bike race, uh, this bike race started, I mentioned, in 1892, and it was initially started to promote uh, the local newspaper called the Express and it was actually Spa Bastogne Spa in those days and the reason they chose Bastogne was so that they could leave Spa get down to Bastogne by uh, train to make sure that the riders had got to the turning point of the race and come back again but uh, it became a very very important uh, spa town thermal town there as you get a chance there to look at the thermal baths in Spa and I bet those look rather beckoning uh, the temperature of the water around about uh, 18 degrees Fahrenheit and a lot of people move down here to enjoy the thermal, the thermal baths of there. So Vokla just uh, hoping that he can get across to this leading group of riders now a minute and 38 seconds Call the Makisa 5% gradient, there is a, a long steady climb just over to the right hand side if they look down uh, around about a minute behind them is uh, Thomas Vokler but uh, the Marquis there in the red jersey of BMC he's just thinking what am I doing here, what a long day in the saddle he really has uh, looked at the breakaway formed after about 15 kilometers, it took a long time for the breakaway to form and as I've said it's a lot of the old experienced riders who have looked at the breakaway today because they quite possibly thought that uh, the breakaway could survive but looking at the time gaps it's consistently coming down at one and a half minutes every few kilometers it gets shaved uh, off by a few seconds seconds is the gap there's the main field so Vokler again you know he's, he's got himself about a 20 to 30 second advantage over the peloton but he's got an awful long ride to get himself down to the Coke de la Redoute 
And what's going to happen to Vokla here is once they've gone over the Col de Macisau, there's eight kilometers to go to the Côte de la Reduc, the start of it. And the main field will accelerate just by the fact that everybody's going to try to start to place their leaders in the first uh, 15 to 20 positions because the narrowness of the Côte de la Reduc means that you really want to start it in the first uh, 15 to 20 positions. It's a narrow little approach before it widens out and becomes a steep climb with some gradients as tough as 22%. So I would expect to see Thomas Vogel getting pulled in before we get down towards the Cote de la Rado. Now let's have a look here at the teams who are still doing the pacemaking. You can see almost the whole of Team Movistar. Now then, this is Pavel Brut. Just looking at the, the hunched shoulders there, I think the, the cold and rain and effort now is starting to pay for this rider from Team Tinkoff. I mentioned earlier, he's 34 years of age, he turned professional with the Tinkoff credit systems, as this team uh, was initially called when it first came onto the scene. And in fact, it was uh, when uh, I first saw him racing in the Tour de Lancar with anyone in self estate with a very long solo breakaway. And I think at the time it was the first victory for Tinkoff credit systems. But you see these climbs really now eating into the rider's energy. In the back, the other teams have got to keep concentrated because from the top of this climb, that's when it's really important to control the race. That's when it's really important to make sure that you head yourself uh, into the Cote de la Redoute in a good position. Now there's the acceleration coming. And, well, I had said that, that DeMarkey was having a hard time. Well, uh, you know, I think all of a sudden, uh, having uh, been sitting at the back on a number of occasions, he said to himself, right, now's the time to have a little bit of a crack at this, and he's opened up the acceleration. The rider going across the gap, though, is Nicolas Edé. That's the rider from Cofidis. This is a long climb, two and a half kilometers. Uh, as I said, there is a time, there is a financial benefit to going over the top of these climbs, uh, six hundred dollars or five hundred euros for the ri first rider to go over the top. Now is a chance to see a little bit of a makeup. There is the main field about to turn right and right again, and uh, in the the bottom there is Thomas Vokler. He's not got very much more than about thirty seconds advantage over the main field. takes on board a uh, gel there sort of swallows it down in one foul swoop there to uh, top up for three four hundred uh, calories for a, a small energy gel like that but at the end of the day 10 or 15 of those will keep you uh, nicely warm to keep the energy levels up for what needs to be done in this last part of the race that strange style of Thomas Bocker has become well known to us over many years you can see now Starting to grapple back, uh, one rider made that response is Thomas de Kent in third position, then Tira Longo, just about to make the junction and just, you see when a rider starts to get onto the front of his saddle as Jeremy Wad did there, that's a point that he really is struggling, he's having a hard time finding the energy to keep going forward, but he knows he's got to get back onto this group before the top of the climb if he can and maybe he'll recover to ride better a little later on. As soon as he made the junction, Thomas again said, right mate, well I'm going to continue with this because this might work here this afternoon. If we reduce the numbers in this breakaway group, which was eight men strong, we may well start to consolidate on our advantage again. And all of a sudden, it seems to inspire these riders because that gap which was down to uh, a minute 35 has crept back up to a minute 50. And De Kent is one guy who never will shirk his work or his responsibility. He will uh, do the job. Vogler is at 51 seconds. So in fact, he's now uh, stretched his advantage out to around about a minute over the peloton. Over towards the top now, the Col de Marquisal. There's four climbs remaining after this one. Uh, the next one on the menu this afternoon is the very, very famous Cote de la Redoute. The stage is set for a battle of champions. The top winners from around the world. I'm not sure if I want it to be raining or I want the sun to be shining because it is going to provide some very dramatic footage and probably a very dramatic attack down towards the end. So it's 37 kilometers to go it is their one minute advantage and again you have to wonder what 
can anybody do to beat Alejandro Valverde here this afternoon? His team have been superb, and uh, that's what he said last night in uh, the uh, the press release that his team put out. Uh, he said basically, if I win today, it will be because of my team, and uh, well, certainly that's what it's going to be all about this afternoon because he has seen his team dominate this race over the last hour and a half. They've done all of the pace making. Better core just over on the left hand side, we went towards the front. It'll be interesting to see how he rides a little bit later on in the season. Look at the weather conditions here as it all now comes back within one minute from the leaders of the race to the chasers to the main field, it's 55 seconds. Well, Julien Alaphilippe seemed to have been a little bit of a, the wonder kid in the Ardennes uh, Classics last year, and, but uh, this year we've seen him already ride exceptionally well. Just uh, four days ago uh, when he went up to second position in the Flesh one but he's been consistent over this week of racing, sixth in the Amstel Gold Race, second uh, in the Flesh Wallon, but he'll be hoping to look after his team, and they do have, I think it is a big advantage for Dan Martin to have uh, Alaphilippe up alongside him. Martin now creeping up to 29 years of age, but he has become quite a specialist, the uh, former Irish champion of these Ardennes Classics. So now the riders go over the top of the Côte de Laredoux, so they'll take uh, a right-hand turn uh, shortly, uh, head down towards uh, Supremont, then they've got a fair bit of uh, smooth, decent road as they head away uh, from uh, the Côte de Laredoux and start to line up to the Côte de la Roche au Faucon or the Rock of the Falcons and that itself is a race a climb that in the past has seen people lay down the foundations but I just feel and getting the feeling of talking to most people around the race talking to Alan Piper from uh, Team BMC the other day that, that everybody will change their tactics because they're kind of riding into the unknown as they were the first time they, they came up to the summit of the Côte de Saint-Nicolas it's riding into the, the unknown not knowing how the body is going to respond in the last five minutes of a race of six and a half hours. De Gent hovering at 10 seconds, Lengen at 38 seconds, the main field. Calm being restored now by Team Movistar on the front end, but still it's a solid unit of Movistar doing all of this pace making. I mean, when you look at those brown leaves, you can't make your mind up whether this is winter or autumn. I can tell you it's actually spring as we this great opportunity on uh, NBC Live Extra to bring a full live coverage uh, of the last uh, three hours of racing here at uh, the Liege Baston Liege. This is the right hand turn. Ooh, a little bit of a squeal and a skid there. And that was De Marchi just going around the corner there. This is the main road now down to uh, Spremont. Not too far uh, behind. Talk about Matty Heyman uh, being the man who never gives up. Well, Thomas de Kent is certainly one of those men who never gives up either. He's round the corner and shortly. I think you'll be back in contact with the leaders. This is uh, Lengen, I am cycling. Hard to tell what team he rides for in that black jersey there, but he's got himself wrapped up against the elements today. Look at this, Thomas Dekent out of the saddle, never given up at all. He was dropped before uh, we got to the uh, top of the Côte de la Redoux, and he said, no, I'm not having that. I've been in the lead for so long to give up uh, the ghost this afternoon that I will drag myself back to the lead of this race. But the lead may well just be temporary because it's only 49 seconds uh, between the two leaders and the chasing pack. And now it's sunny once again. Well, they're saying it's 55 seconds. This is a very fast little descent now uh, into uh, Sprimont. Uh, once they get into Sprimont, uh, they will get onto the National 30 for uh, a number of kilometres before they then uh, uh, make a fair sail. And they've got a little bit of respite, 16 kilometres or 10 miles between the summit of the two climbs, the Côte de la Redoute and the Côte de la Roche au Faucon. And it's a mainly decent road like this and time to recover for the breakaway, but time to get organised for the men in the main peloton behind them. Eddie Merckx, uh, not only uh, winner of 10 
of uh, the Ardennes Classics that holds a record for the Amsterdam Goal Race, Flesh Malone and Liege Bast and Liege victories, but also he's the record holder for the rider who's finished uh, in the top 10 of Liege Bast and Liege the most number of times, two on 10 occasions. Uh, five of those, by the way, were victories. Quite a large peloton. I think we'll start to see that number get reduced as we get closer to the next climb of the day. But uh, in the past, we've seen after the Côte de la Redoute, uh, a group of only 25 to 30 riders. I think everybody is holding back the time when they make that decisive move to try and get themselves a finish because of the fact that they've added that extra climbing down towards you. And that's where the suspense is going to be. But anybody in a race like this anybody who's been able to nurse their energy and one man you've not seen so far we've hardly talked about him is a former winner who's in the pack and that is Simon Gerrans and that if you remember when Simon Gerrans uh, won this race for Australia a, a, a number of years ago you hardly ever saw him at all uh, Simon Gerrans he was just uh, hovering there waiting for the right time to come up towards uh, the top of the race and then all of a sudden he popped out of the pack and he got himself the victory and that can be extremely important that was back in 2014 when Gerrans popped out of the pack well, two monuments Simon Gerrans in his career one of those are Milan San Remo and one of the ones that he thought was not a race of his suiting is actually this one here he said I never thought that I was a Liège Baston Liège winner until the day that I actually came up and won it but he said the more and more I think about Liège Baston Liège now the more and more I actually want to try and win this race for a second time the form is there he was placed extremely well now this is where we're starting to see some more action coming I uh, don't want to hang around too much more as we see the move coming from Astana now Astana have had a man in the breakaway uh, Tiralongo was in the breakaway for a long period of time the race situation Ede de Gent and De Marchi lead the race uh, but this uh, long this used to be a, a climb in the old days the Côte de Sprimont we don't count it as a climb anymore as now all of a sudden that Orica Green Edge get themselves mixed up in the aggressive nature of the front end of the peloton but the gap is not much at 39 seconds the three leaders are probably at this speed about 600 meters difference between them and the front end of the peloton looks like the style of through moving down the left hand side there as well team sky now will be thinking about trying to set up the, the final part of this race I heard he was working on his velocity in the offseason. How is it so? Get into uh, Mary, the ride along the valley. Now we're seeing a different team coming to the front, Etix Quickstep. That's for their two pronged attack, I would have to think. Uh, Ala Philippe and, of course, uh, Dan Martin. Martin, I'm sure, completely motivated uh, with a change to this uh, brand new team. He's had a pretty good start to the season as well, Martin. I think he's quite happy with this, uh, this change of team. And Martin, 29 years of age, ideal age for a professional cyclist. Oh, there's a crash on the left. I just spotted a crash on the left hand side. Uh, difficult to see who it is, but now, oh, uh, it's a Katusha rider, a Cannondale rider has gone down. Tinkoff rider has gone down as well. A little bit further up the road. Number 27 who went down, the Zangle uh, Vicioso. Uh, this is the rider at the back here, and he's uh, one of the oldest riders in the race at 39 years of age. And uh, I think uh, Rafael Maika is the rider who went down there from Tinkoff. We're getting that information over race radio. There he is, he's been taken away. Well, uh, the medical uh, doctors and assistants are uh, right up there very, very quickly, but at 25 kilometers to go, that's uh, team manager, team manager uh, up alongside him there. King Bruno Ken Yalta is the team manager. So Angel Vicioso is the rider there who uh, came down from Team Katusha. Now that will be a little bit tough for Joachim Rodriguez a little bit later on. 11 seconds, 25 kilometers to go for the two leaders. 
it's not much I mean we are looking 50 to 100 meters this is the descent now where they're getting all the motorbikes all of the team referee cars out of the way and it's Etix quick step now have decided they really want to wind it up they're coming down to the part of the race where they want to dominate they are I said a little bit earlier on a team who have put so much into their classics campaign and so far really don't have a lot to show this is the team that we've always expected in the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix yes Tom Bonham was in second place but it's not been the dominant performances they've had over the last couple of seasons at Etix Quick Step today maybe they might change that with a new man on their team as well Dan Martin or the man that they had last year who finished in second place uh, Julien Alaphilippe the young Frenchman who may well break that uh, record of 36 years without a victory in this race for France and that going back to 1980 and Bernardino of Nicolas Hedé you can almost feel the cold that he's been experiencing throughout the whole of this afternoon as uh, we have to get that motorbike out there quite smartly now as the gap has now been closed down coming onto the back looks like uh, Lotto Sudal trying to keep this race pretty much nice and tight but Etix Quickstep uh, are not relinquishing their control at the front end of the main peloton Hedé around this corner it's a nasty little descent this down into the valley road and then quickly along the valley road they'll take a left hand turn and then they've got the Côte de la Roche au Faucon 23 kilometers and it's all together so there we go 23 kilometers to go and it's all together for the first time since the 15th kilometer this morning when that breakaway of eight riders got clear very very early on and built them up for the lead of uh, nine minutes at one stage and now it's very much all back together so as race radio is saying uh, regroupement général everybody's back together quickly looking down there at Mary and the Chateau du Monceau there's a crash been announced in the main field uh, a rider from uh, direct energy has gone down according to race radio well, we can't get the images because we have to make sure we keep uh, the camera as far away from the main field as possible in these rarely clear critical stages because it's all about uh, another crash a coffee to somebody from coffee to some giving you this information because I'm getting it from the race radio so Lotto Sudal coming to take uh, a little bit of uh, pressure off of the Etix quick step team who are looking back and they are well drilled and looking back to see if we can see Dan Martin he's riding a different colored bike to the rest of the guys on his team he's got a white bike with a panda painted on the front of it and uh, shamrocks on the back end to of course remind himself if he had ever forgotten that he is of good Irish stock there he is Dan Martin there's that white bike I was telling you about he looks concentrated teammate in front of him uh, Alaphilippe and Geshka in the uh, beard and this this is the the action at the back that's the Cofidis rider that had that little bit of an incident just a few moments ago that's uh, Julien Simon he actually uh, placed in this race doesn't look like uh, he's having a, a great time you might have seen the dark blue dark gray color of the skies in the background and yes it is looking a little bit nasty once again on the finish line it's not snowing uh, but it is extremely damp right get rid of the jackets now it's all about the critical part of this race uh, the race organizers decided to change this just a little bit now this we will see a little bit of a sorting out coming now as we start the third climb before the end and this is the climb climb of the Côte de la Roche au Faucon 1.3 kilometers long doesn't sound very much does it but when you've been on a bike for six hours it is extremely difficult 11 percent is the gradient uh, it was kept out of this race uh, in 2013 uh, because they uh, needed to do some road oh there's a little problem on the right hand side somebody's got a mechanical problem and uh, it was uh, introduced uh, in 2008 narrow road you can see 
well in control at its quick step but not far away from the front you might have also spotted there Alejandro Valverde there are a lot of no, jerseys there from Team Sky but anybody who has not got any power in those legs as the Etix quick step rider there is uh, showing us has uh, turned out the lights and gone to the back of the classroom Dan Martin funny old style of Dan Martin uh, bobbing away there in second position as uh, Julian Alaphilippe ejects the bottle they are waiting for some acceleration to come here well Pools is up there on the right hand side not too far away either is uh, Tony Gallopat there's still a lot of riders towards the front Enrico Gasparotto is not far away either you can spot him just a little bit further back in the uh, pale blue and white jersey over on the left Astana they're looking for Vincenzo Nibali and they may well be looking for Jakob Fulsang a lot of people have said that Fulsang has got uh, some form under his belt there is Nibali just uh, in the middle there with the Italian flag across his middle he looks quite comfortable uh, he's a rider who has actually nursed himself quite well through this race here this afternoon and so it'll all be about that I'm sure it's all going to be about that final little climb on the day Still, uh, takes quick step. They want to keep this sorted. Uh, Julien Alaphilippe, Mount Baldy stage winner in the Amgen Tour of California, second in Liège Baston Liège uh, last week, and uh, last year, second in Liège Baston Liège last year is uh, what I meant to say. Sorry. Second in the Flèche Wallon just four days ago, looking over his shoulder. He's got to his thermal gear uh, all over him to keep himself nice and warm. 20 kilometers to go, that banner says. That's 12 miles. We could be looking at uh, half an hour, 30 minutes, because I would not expect to see a speed uh, very much in excess of 40 kilometers an hour over this last 30 minutes of racing. Well, the sunshine uh, bathing the riders now, having uh, seen uh, all kinds of weather conditions uh, from spring through to winter in the space of one day, in the space of six hours of racing now as they come towards the top of this climb. Uh, no major moves just yet, and this is what we kind of expected because of the inclusion, this final interesting little climb, but it is doing damage. If you look back, you can see there's a decanting going on here this afternoon. A lot of riders are just not able to stay in contact on these uh, final few slopes of the Côte de Roche au Faucon. It's a tough old climb here. It looks like a beautiful day out there on the course. We're inside, as I said, the last 30 minutes. The main field pretty much all together. Came together at 23 kilometers ago, just before the start of the Roche au Faucon. Plenty of riders still prepared to eject their uh, extra raincoats, their extra over jackets. Huge crowd. A little acceleration, but no, that was just to try and um, make sure he uh, got out of the uh, boxed in position there to find a team helper, take on board another drink. But you see how observant. The rider was there from Movistar, he said, ah, I am not letting anybody go clear after all of the work and the pacemaking that we have been putting in over this last part of it. One man I haven't seen yet either is a man who is the leader of Team BMC Racing here, Sammy Sanchez, who himself uh, had a very, very good ride just a couple of days ago in uh, the flesh wall and he finished sixth over the top now of the Roche au Faucon. The thing about the next car while they're on the descent etix quick step but these riders at the back are paying for a very hard day in the saddle and this is where the elimination is happening over the top of the climb of uh, the Côte de la Roche au Faucon 232 kilometers covered by these riders today and now it's downhill 20 kilometers 12 miles a little gap starting to appear this part of the course they've now got themselves about 14 kilometers to the next climb which is uh, around about eight miles of racing but it's quick 
they go over the top of this climb a little bit of a false flat to over this part of the climb and then they drop down very very quickly over the valley of the river Meuse, across the river Meuse, which across the border is called the Maas as it goes through Maastricht and then they wheel their way through a very complicated part of uh, Anse and line themselves up for the Côte de Saint-Nicolas. The thing about the Côte de Saint-Nicolas is it's so steep. Even if you don't attack, a lot of riders will get eliminated on the slopes of that climb. So. Starting to see uh, Sky move up towards the front. They realize that kwiatkowski has got pretty good form. But Etik's quick step are very much in control. Just looking back and see what happened to him. There's Alaphilippe having a quick chat. It's good to see that Alaphilippe and Dan Martin there in third and fourth position in those dark blue jerseys chatting to each other. It's always good if you've got two leaders on the team and you, you talk together and you work out well together seems to be the situation between those two riders 23 years of age for Ala Philippe the youngster on the block 29 years of age for Dan Martin and again still haven't seen very much of uh, Simon Gerrans but you won't see much of Simon Gerrans until it comes down to the last part of the race it's all about keeping the uh, armory full lost uh, one of their important riders, uh, Rafael Maika, in a nice little crash. I don't think he'll be getting back into the race. Well, Pools is in the middle area for Team Sky in that black jersey. Now here's a keep the pressure on for Team Movistar. Now this may well be to take the sting out of everybody else's tail. This is Carlos Betancourt, a Colombian, and he just wants to toughen the race up. He's a rider who, in his own right, uh, has actually placed in this race in the past. And this is a rider who, for a couple of years, was on AG Tuala Mondial. He just did not feel comfortable with that team. You know, it's a French-speaking team. He's a Spanish-speaking rider. And now he has gone out on the attack. Uh, a couple of years ago, in 2013, he was fourth in liege baston liege And look at the pressure he's putting on to Etix Quickstep. Look at the gap there starting to appear. Dan Martin's there in sixth position. Teammates in front of him, but they've got to not panic at a moment like this. And this is uh, very clever tactics by Team Movistar because it takes pressure off the team. It forces the other teams to chase out. And Betancourt really is quite a magical climber. He also, by the way, finished ninth in the Tour of Lombardy, which is a very, very difficult race. The race of the falling leaves, it's called. It takes place in October towards the end of the year. Having a look down there, you can see there's a serious sorting out. There's the white jersey over on the right-hand side. I haven't spoken very much about him either. Another good rider, an outside chance for a victory for uh, Rui Costa, the Portuguese national champion. So, this move here is not the move to win the race. It's the move to put pressure onto the riders of Etix Quickstep. But it's come from a rider who's got such a pedigree uh, behind his name that they have to respond. They can't say, oh, well, we'll catch him later on. Because with two difficult climbs coming towards the finish, they've got to chase this guy down now. Look at the weather conditions again changing so dramatically. That's what it's like in the Ardennes. It changes every five or ten minutes. But that group, I mentioned earlier before, the, uh, the Côte de la Redoute, what a massive group it was. It's now all of a sudden, just because of the way the race is unfolding, become uh, decanted down to the real heads of state. These are the men who are getting left behind. And every time you get dropped, it's more and more difficult to come back with these nasty little climbs towards the end of liege baston liege So looking down, not much more than 30 riders, but five riders. I did say that Etix Quickstep were a very strong squad in depth. Strength in depth is exactly what can be required. They're right onto the main road now, this right-hand turn is uh, going to be a nice, fast part of the race. It's a big dual carriageway, a four-lane highway. From the top of this climb, the Côte de la Rochefoucauld, and then it's downhill 
very very quickly we'll see speeds uh, in excess of 50 miles an hour 80 kilometers an hour as we pass through probably one of the most um, ugly parts of the years where the former old steel mills uh, still stand to this day although uh, year on year they're slowly dismantling them the steel industry which completely collapsed and led to a real running down of the area around the years in a difficult economic part of uh, the history of the French speaking part of Belgium but it's part of history and it's part of this bike race and it's one of the reasons why the area we're going to go through a little bit uh, later on for the penultimate climb of the day the Côte de Saint Nicolas is actually full of Italians a lot of Italians uh, moved up to this part of uh, the world uh, during another uh, time of economic crisis and they moved from Italy and made uh, Belgium and French speaking Belgium very much their home and when we we might not see too many today because the weather conditions are atrocious but usually when you come into the area of uh, Tilleur just at the bottom of San Nicola you see plenty of Italian flags hoping that maybe Vincenzo Nibali is going to be the winner for them this afternoon at the side of the road really rattling the cage now uh, Carlos Betancourt on the left hand side they're wearing number two of team Movistar one of the teammates of Alejandro Valverde and the reason he's doing that is to put the pressure on Etix Quickstep it's not much of a gap it's a hundred meters gap but it means that Etix Quickstep have to keep the pressure on they have to continue to chase they have to keep riding to make sure they pull that man back into the fold and Betancourt by the way got himself a nice little victory early on this year he won himself a stage of the Vuelta Castilla Leon in uh, the northern part of Spain <laughs> now scuttling trying to find a, a way to get their ride look at that group it's not very big at all down to not much more than 30 riders now having been out into the countryside this is when it starts to get precarious and dangerous as well because if you've ever raced uh, in Europe and you've ever tried to ride in wet conditions over these white lines these painted white lines uh, you put a little bit of moisture over the top of them they are treacherous The sky now making sure that they can keep it up. Uh, Betancourt is not uh, slowing down at all. Betancourt moves up to the front. Uh, that was uh, Michael Kwiatkowski himself coming forward and doing a little bit of pace making. So maybe they've uh, switched it around there. Maybe they've decided that the thing to do here is um, look after Walter Pools who was looking pretty good a few moments ago at the front end of the peloton nine and a half kilometers to go at the top of the Côte de la San Nicolas is six and a half kilometers to go to the finish it's three kilometers to the top of the climb it's one and a half kilometers to the bottom of the climb but the positioning is so very important and around the back here uh, it really is it's a precarious approach to these final few kilometers but everybody in the back of their minds knows what's in store for them now they know there's just two climbs left to go in Liège Baston Liège the 102nd running of this race which first was organized back in 1892 between Spa and Bastogne it's now for the last number of years since 1992 have found its home of the finish line here at the summit in Ors since then they introduced that nasty little climb in the San Nicolas and today for our delights they've thrown in one more it's wet here on the finishing line and as the finishing uh, final climb of the day is about two kilometers away from here I would expect the cobbles to be a little slippy which is going to have an effect on traction it's going to be extremely important you have to remain seated in the saddle you're going to have to uh, make sure that you've got the right gearing in street once again uh, all these riders peering for their the right hand turn which they all know from either having watched this race on television for many many years or having done the reconnaissance over the last couple of days while they've been staying not too far away Warren Barghi just over on the left hand side you know uh, Bardet also moving up towards the front and he's being looked after by his teammates uh, Bardet by the way he's the rider there in uh, second position for AG Tuala Mondial he was second in the under 23 uh, Liège-Baston-Liège but uh, since then 
he was 13th in 2013, 10th in 2014 and 6th in 2015. Will he go better than that today? Well, he certainly is hoping so. The season so far this year has not been a bad one either. He finished second overall in the Tour of Oman and that was because of a mountain top finish. Now then, you see just even the pressure there has created a little bit of a split in the peloton as well as we start the approach now to the Cote de San Nicolas. This is it. Betancourt again going on the right hand side there as he uh, gets out of the saddle. He's on the drop. Very difficult to ride a steep climb like this but he certainly is trying to toughen this race up. He's throwing the gauntlet down to everybody here this afternoon to say right if you want to win uh, this race this afternoon you better come after me because my man Alejandro Valverde has got the form of his life uh, as we head up towards the preparation for the Giro d'Italia as well. So Betancourt I think he decided uh, he was going a little bit too hard there so he decided to sit back. There's number one right on the shoulders there of uh, the Movistar rider in the middle, Alejandro Valverde. Walter Pools has now moved up, he's into third or fourth position. And there in the white jersey on the left hand side in about uh, 12th position, uh, Rui Costi. Look at that, all of a sudden talk about a sorting out and there's not yet been an attack. The attacks have yet to come. There is uh, Joachim Rodriguez in uh, third position, a little bit further back in the red jersey. Got a teammate up alongside him just to help him put the pressure on. It's as you get up towards the top of this time, that's when we'll start to see the moves and the accelerations coming. But again, a little bit of a waiting game, and that's what everybody expected today because of this addition of this final climb. But it has sorted out the pack once again from 35 40 riders. We're now down to 25 riders or so. The guys at the back just hanging on. Oh, Vincenzo Nibali. Well, the Italian flag will not fly uh, tonight at the top of Liege, Baston Liege, because uh, Vincenzo Nibali is at the back end of this group. The Italians were right after all. He did not quite have the form that he needs, but his goals may be just a little bit further down the road this year. Uh, that is uh, Roma. Bardet on the uh, right hand side and he wants to make another move he's not scared of the distance of the finish he makes another little acceleration another little dig there from the young Frenchman there as he tries to open up a gap between himself and everybody else but he knows that over the top of this climb there is another climb to come sits back down again the, the energy not there to continue with that acceleration Looks like Barghi as well over on the left hand side now in the giant Alperson jersey but Astana make the acceleration once again. Well, Astana had a man in the breakaway very early on it was uh, Paolo Tirolongo. Looking at this acceleration we're starting to see the, the gaps opening. Once they get to the top of this climb looks like a response coming from Movistar and just trying to see through the haze a little bit of a blur front to the looks like Simon Gerrans this is Simon Gerrans he too uh, wrapped up very very much against the cold and as uh, we get a look forward the, the style of Simon Gerrans here so so just over the top of the climb this is uh, Zakarin who's uh, gone through here for uh, Katusha. Oh, around that corner. Now Zakarin had a very good start to the year. He uh, won a stage of Paris-Nice. And uh, he also finished in fourth place overall. Now they've got a little bit of a gap. But still quite a big group. Uh, bigger than it was uh, last year. But bear in mind there is still that nasty little climb to go. Six kilometres. So, oh, Zakar, well, you see, this is going to be so precarious. And this is... Uh, they're really nasty roads here, uh, these cobbles. They're actually pretty decent cobbles. They're, they're small, square cobbles, but if you don't have the right tyre pressure on a situation like this and you touch the brakes, uh, we saw the, the moment of panic there for Zakarin. Nino Zakarin, who's been a professional since uh, 2012. It's uh, Diego Rosa who's managed to come out here for Team Astana. Now, he's obviously... Uh, riding pretty well he rode the tour of the Pay Basque which is a good race to prepare for a race like this uh, and he won the 
king of the mountains in that event as well there he's uh, 27 years of age there you can see Bardet also moving up there uh, is Roman Kurtziger is the rider from Tinkoff he wears number 41 there's 21 that's uh, Purito Joachim Rodriguez he's comfortable Bargui is there as well in the black jersey from uh, Giant Alpacinto none of the big big favorites so far being caught out apart from uh, Vincenzo Nibali who uh, his form was always a, a little bit questionable but it's going to be how they handle this next climb 5.3 kilometers to go and normally I would tell you that's going to be five minutes to the finish but it's not five minutes to the finish on a day like today it's probably going to take uh, seven to eight minutes to know who's going to win this year's edition of Liège Baston Liège and it's question of positioning as well because you, you ride down to the bottom of this climb uh, there as you can see is five kilometers to go the banner there then you start to approach the same finishing straight in Anse as last year then all of a sudden you take a right hand turn and there's a four kilometer loop which brings you back the way down towards the finish Welcome back I think Alejandro Valverde is still looking pretty comfortable but somebody if they've got the power in their legs can make the move on this new climb that's been added into Liège Baston Liège and with that acceleration we could see a lone victory but are they scared of it are they concerned about the fact that it's a little bit damp out there on the course because those cobblestones at 10 percent you have to sit down in the seat to make sure you retain the traction this is a small group but Roman Bardet is the rider there for AG to R there is a Rui Costa now this is the acceleration now for the corner everybody's looking as we start to see there's a move and acceleration coming there from Lamprey now they all know it's a corner is looming up ahead of them they want to make sure that they get into that corner in the first four or five positions now the funny thing is a lot of riders uh, like the Tom Boonans the Fabian Cancellaras of this world would not be concerned about this climber towards the end of a race the Cote de la Rue Nagneau because they're used to riding on cobbles they're expert at riding on cobbles most of these guys are normally the the guys that we would see in the Giro d'Italia the Tour de France is a different style of rider they're not used to racing on cobblestones that are about to approach in front of them 3.6 kilometers to go they're not far away now uh, there oh if you turn left then you would have gone up to the finishing line there uh, in the old route but here we are turning uh, left here very shortly in about six or seven hundred meters they'll turn right and that is when they'll start there it is in fact it's a lot shorter than I thought it was uh, yesterday now this is the start of the climb this is a brand new climb who has got the power to make the move here on the front uh, the coach de la rue Nagno the acceleration immediately coming from Etix Quickstep but they're looking around where's Dan Martin where is Julian Alaphilippe where is Alejandro Valverde in a good position in that white jersey there though the champion of Portugal Rui Costa well it's a little bit damp a little bit dry in certain places on this climb it's a straight road it's a road up to the heavens and the heavens are calling for somebody here this afternoon number five there is a uh, Yon Isagira number one just sitting comfortably there waiting holding position in the middle of your screen there is Alejandro Valverde but is he a little bit too far back Jan Bakalans at the rear end of the group he uh, rides for a G2R Le Mondial and look at this uh, damage is being done on this nasty little climber look at that what a thing to throw in now the acceleration coming now from a G uh, from Orica Greenedge Orica Greenedge uh, realizing this is the move the response though where it looks like Michael Albacini's made the move and uh, seeing that Albacini is a very dangerous character all of a sudden uh, Rui Costa has decided it's time for him to make the move but where is Alejandro Valverde Valverde's been caught out by this cobbled climb Michael Albacini now makes the move he's got company Rui Costa you know Albacini was seventh just a couple of days ago in the Flesh Wallon Oh, fighting gear across there it looked as if that was the shape coming across of the BMC rider and that is Sammy Sanchez Olympic gold medalist in 2008 in Beijing and the damage is being done and that is the top of the climb Albacini followed by Costa followed by Sammy Sanchez coming across Sammy Sanchez has said he wants to try and get himself the victory of this 
So the head of the race, Albacini, they've got the gap. Now's the time when they've really got to take all of the risks and put the hammer down. It's slightly downhill at this point as they start to line themselves up for the, the normal part of the course. So around the corner, Albacini way around that corner very very fast uh, Rui Costa also a man in form just a couple of days ago when he went to the top of the Flesh Wallon he finished 10th at the top of the Flesh Wallon Sammy Sanchez th these are all riders who were in the top 10 of Flesh Wallon just a couple of days ago Albacini be a difficult one to call if it comes down to the sprint as Albacini looks over his shoulder once again it's a fast fast sweeper but who's going to take control at the back around these corners you can hear the whistling and that's uh, the organizers trying to make this nice and clear there is the gap and it's a very different definite gap now as we come around this corner as, as Tinkoff are working for their man and their man is Roman Krötiger at this moment 1.9 kilometers to go these riders have only got four or five seconds advantage Ted de la course at the head of the race back to the normal finish now and uh, this is probably just about enough for the winner to come from this group but they've got to keep collaborating right, while Tapools has come into the group now this is a big gap Sammy Sanchez knows this is a very big chance for him to try and get himself the win Sammy Sanchez uh, won uh, the stage of the tour of the pay basket Costa former world champion let's not forget is the man in third position there and these riot guys realize they could be writing their names onto the bottom of the trophy of a monument so this is the fourth monument race of the year after Milan San Remo Tour of Flanders Paris Roubaix it's now the turn of Liège Baston Liège the oldest of them all Le Doyen now they're starting to do some work there for uh, Alejandro Valverde but where is he Albacini is and again Katusha make the move uh, inside of the Flam Rouge uh, the red kite well there we go now it's uh, uh, Albacini makes a move big acceleration going for Albacini inside of the final kilometer you've got to be careful how you go around that corner but he's opened up a gap uh, Rui Costa sits back down in the saddle scrambling to get to the back wheel scrambling to get to the wheel of Michael Albacini Well, Walter Pools there, looks calm, looks, uh, just sits at the back wheel, looks at Rui Costa. Rui Costa flicks his wrist, says, come on mate, you want to win a classic, you've got to work for it, you've got to work hard. And all the time, Michael Albacini stretches open the gap, but they're back into his slipstream. Walter Pools, you know, when we look back, a Dutchman has not won this race for a very long time. And I think uh, when we think about the last Dutchman to win this race, you've got to go all the way back to Adrie van der Poel back in 1988. So, four leaders, 500 metres to go, the left-hand turn is just up there, Alter Pools looking to make a little bit of Dutch history and rewrite their history books and there's the move coming from the rider in Sky, makes the acceleration but immediately there's a response from Michael Albacini, Albacini right onto his wheel and oh, daylight appearing between them and everybody else but they can't play around at a moment like this. Albacini, they're looking back, they're trying to judge if they've got enough time for a bit of cat and mouse on the running down towards the finish. It's like Warren Bargui trying to get across for the, the lesser placings, but the turn is about to happen for the leading group of four. And here they are, Albacini, who's going to lead into the corner? 2.50 to go. Looks back, Sammy Sanchez, he can pull out a good sprint when he wants to. So Wild pulls around the corner in second position. Wild pulls makes the acceleration for Team Sky. He's got to get into the right gear. Albacini moves into second position. This is going to be amazing for Holland if he can hold on to it. He makes the acceleration, but Wild Bacini's right into his wheel. Sammy Sanchez has sat up. Coming up alongside him now is Albacini, and it's struggling to the line. Yes, it is. Wild pulls gets Sky, the big monument they've been looking at for many, many years, and that will readjust the look of the top end of the book because now since 1988 they've waited to get their victory here Wouter Poel will inherit that from Audrey van der Poel as the rest of the main come in there well what a turnout that was and what an amazing climb that was to throw in at the end of Liège at Bastogne Liège well they said it was going to be for Michael Kwiatkowski but look at this this is a man who has had the form so far this season
Well, a few more stragglers uh, starting to come in. Uh, that will be the fifth victory of Wild Pools this year after winning the Tour of Valencia, a stage in Catalonia. But this is most certainly probably the one that he wanted. After just about six and a half hours in the saddle, it will take a, a while for him to, uh, to get the feeling back into uh, many of the extremities having been put under a serious amount of pressure here this afternoon but uh, like many teams uh, they waited until the last minute they let a lot of the other teams uh, do a lot of the pacemaking I can hear the music starting to crank itself up now so that would be an indication that we're about to begin with the presentations here at the 102nd edition of Paris-Roubaix see the bands around this man's uh, neck and his arms so that's an indication that he's a former champion of the world he's the current champion of Portugal and the man who finished in third place today at Liège Baston Liège Rui Costa congratulations uh, just over to the right hand side as he climbed onto the podium uh, Bernard Hino uh, the last Frenchman to win here in Liège back in 1980 Rui Costa, well, he saw the move, he knew it was the winning move and he uh, followed it at the right time, but he could do nothing to beat the sprint, the finishing speed of Wouter Pools. Man who made the move and uh, looked for the victory, and there uh, you can see him as well now about to come up and uh, receive uh, the accolades for second position on today's stage, Michael Albacini of Switzerland. Well, Albacini had the plan. He was not afraid at all of that climb down towards the finish, but unfortunately, he found a slightly faster man over the last 200 meters. But the man who will receive uh, the biggest accolades, as I said a little earlier, not far away from home because Holland is just down uh, the river Meuse from here. And it will be, and what a touch that is as well, because uh, the man from Holland will receive his award of orange flowers, as in the House of Orange. Well, there you go, Wout Pouls gets himself a uh, top step of the podium. Uh, he gets the trophy of liege Baston liege of the 102nd edition, a race organized back in 1892. And some very nice uh, orange flowers to reflect the color of Holland, the House of Orange. And there he is, and I think you can hardly believe that he's got himself onto the top step of the podium, but he did, and this is how he did it. Just looking down there between his legs to check and make sure there's going to be no last minute surprise attack. A second look down there to check. And then at this point as he looks forward, he knows he's got it. He opens up the gas as he gets to the line. He knows he's written his name down on a little piece of cycling history. And there is the final podium. Uh, Walter Pools ahead of Michael. Albacini on the right hand side and uh, Rui Faria da Costa on the left hand side in third position and far over to the right hand side Benaino, the five time winner of the Tour de France. Sounds as if um, he's won himself a special little prize out on the course as well because he's going to be presented with a leg of Bastogne ham. And there you go. Well, I hope he's got the power after six and a half uh, hours uh, in the saddle to uh, keep hold of that. I hope he's got a nice machine at home in his kitchen uh, for slicing it nice and thin. So, out the pulls, the accolades of the French speaking Belgian 
crowd here in uh, Liège, getting himself uh, the biggest one-day victory of his career. And I would think uh, they'll be extremely happy when they get to the dinner table tonight, Team Skybot. They won't be celebrating too much because uh, many of them will be lining up for the uh, tour of Romandie, which starts on Tuesday. Part of the big preparation, uh, Wild Pools is part of the big team of uh, Sky and Chris Froome's defence of uh, the Tour de France uh, when they will ride uh, the Tour of Romandie, followed then after that by the Tour of the Dauphiné, the Criterium du Dauphiné, and then into the Tour de France. There's a uh, last look there at the Classement de l'Épreuve, uh, the result of the race. Wout Pools very, very proudly on the top spot.